Welcome back to our channel. Help us print our next issue by buying us a coffee. Thank you for supporting Archetype. I, I don't want to jump right into the piece. I, I sort of want to preempt it uh, by uh, asking you about New York City because uh, the piece is very much centered around the city and uh, you know your, your interactions with the city and your life that you've built there. Could you just tell me about sort of your upbringing in New York City and, and what that's, that's been like? When I was real little, I was in the suburbs. Uh, but my mother moved to New York City in 1987, and then I was here full time starting in the early 90s. Place is often another character. And so because New York is so big and New York has been so much of my life, New York is often a character in my writing. There are a lot of things that are very cliche about New York City private school life that I experienced <laughs> um, growing up here. I have a very interesting relationship with it now in my 40s. I, I am so much a New Yorker that I am a New Yorker without New York. When I leave New York, I am still a New Yorker and I'm here because New York is home. My family's here, but I... I've fallen a little out of love with New York. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's about, like, if you were to move to your hometown. When I moved back here, I moved to my hometown, which happened to be this big, iconic city. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, there is an energy here, and I do like it. I find as I get older, it can be a little overwhelming. I don't know if it's older or if it's COVID or if it's... But it is, it can be, if it's not overwhelming, it can be really... Uh, energizing and there's something about the privacy of being in a big city um people often don't think of it as private but there's a sort of social agreement to give each other privacy when you're on top of each other right mm -hmm. uh, i'm curious you said that um it can be a bit overwhelming what do you do or how do you how do you manage that when you feel really overwhelmed by the city well i you know my home is actually pretty quiet. Um, we did move to a more quiet apartment. Uh, and, you know, I just, I find moments of quiet. I find parks, especially parks like Central Park, or if you're in Brooklyn, maybe Prospect Park. Um, a lot of the newer parks that are converted industrial spaces still feel very urban, mm. but you can really feel like you are a little more, a little closer to some quiet and nature if you get into like some of the older parks. So I live in Toronto and I find it a bit overwhelming because I'm originally from Nova Scotia and it's very, it's very quiet and peaceful and very much in nature. And so uh, my roommate once told me, if you're ever feeling stressed, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, just go outside and touch grass. Mm -hmm. And that phrase touch grass has been in my head a lot. So um, I totally agree with that sentiment. It's huge. I um, I do, I fortunately get out of the city of Fairmount and I go up to uh, Massachusetts and bare feet in the grass as as well into the winter as I can tolerate it. Um, <laughs> or touch snow. Makes, yeah, <laughs> it makes it makes a huge difference. It's yeah. literally grounding. Absolutely. I love that. Um, I'm hoping that we can we can chat a bit about your your experience with writing um, because you are a writing writer of course uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in in knowing sort of what was the beginning of writing for you what really drew you towards writing I mean I've been writing as I like to say I've been writing in secret a very long time I was writing in what I didn't know was um, personal essays uh, mm. in high school um, and at the time, you know, the movies that were very popular also had very strong uh, voices to them. You know, it was the Pulp Fiction, Clerks, you know, era. I was really kind of became intrigued by the way people talk to each other, like natural, natural speech, as opposed to what I was reading in a lot of the books I was reading for school, yeah. um, which didn't feel like natural speech, at least as a 90s New Yorker. Um, and so just trying to capture that, I think, in dialogue was something I would do a lot, just like my free time with my IBM compatible computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I wrote up a fair amount of like angsty teen poetry that I don't think has made it out into the world, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a zine here or there with something in it. I really, and this was something I only recently admitted, was it was always a dream, but I didn't think I'd be good at it. Um, I didn't think it was something I could do. Mm. I am um, I am dyslexic, and it takes me 
a long time to read. I also really never grasped the sort of traditional concepts of grammar, and I didn't really go to a school that taught it. So when I got to college, I wrote, I was to say, I wrote a really good history paper, but I always struggled actually in literature classes. I mm. felt overwhelmed by the amount of reading, by close reading, and this was a skill I never really developed. And so it wasn't until like well into my adulthood. So I kept writing, but I wasn't really showing it to anybody or I would send it out, but I wouldn't show it to anybody. And I'd send it out to journals. And of course it got rejected because no one looked at it to be like, oh, you could tighten this up. You know, no one was, I wasn't getting feedback to learn. Right. But I actually just, I blogged, I blogged in secret again. (laughs) um, When blogger was a new thing, I had two different blogs. Uh, One was about books and one was just about life. And I didn't tell anybody about it. And then I wrote personal (laughs) essays and didn't tell anybody about it. And then I went from all of the secret writing to being very called to write a book that's more related to my work. And it's, um, it could fall under the category of prescriptive memoir. When I got the idea to write it, it was really going to be more of a textbook. I have this book in me. And I sought out a literary coach who I also happened to know. And I was like, how, I was like, I know I can write a book, but I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> like, they need a process. And that was in 2018. Um, and I went, I went deep and um, I did, I wrote a book, it was published. <laughs> and That's awesome. uh, along the way, there was a lot of kind of professional writing and I did, I got good grades and could write a, a decent research paper. And that's really and now it's it's every morning i you know it's a right re- it's a regular practice for me wow. because it's um really it's not every morning it's usually two weeks every morning two weeks of like thinking i should write back and forth but it seems to be a pretty consistent rhythm of two weeks on two weeks off that's awesome yeah that's great um and and what were some of the the early influences uh for you ideas or people yeah. or places sure so there was this sort of like um trends towards this dialogue heavy movies um and i do think actually that was a big influence uh hemingway who still shows up in a lot of my writing influentially um especially movable feast um i will say, i will say you know when i was like a middle school age reader um there wasn't a lot of young adult the way there is now, you know, why yeah. is this huge? And my mother handed me The Sun Also Rises and she was like, here, this was one of my favorites. So I read it when I was 12. <laughs> and she was like, do you know what impotence is? And I was like, no. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Time to learn. <laughs> so there is the, but, uh, a movable feast and the way Hemingway kind of writes about food and then also just the rhythm to his writing has always mm. sort of stayed with me. Um, and then a lot of, I put them in the like food memoir category, Ruth Reichel, um, Molly Weisenberg are two authors who really inspire me a lot. And lastly, there, I don't know, she's my favorite essayist. Um, she's also a fiction novelist. Sloan Crosley is mm. a huge influence. Um, I'm a big, I wrote her a fan letter and she replied and Oh, that's great. <laughs> now, now, you know, whatever, forever. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make you a lifelong fan when, yeah. when they respond. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm hoping we can dive a bit into the piece that you submitted to Archetype, which is going to be published in our second issue, October 22nd, Collections. It is definitely a personal essay, I'd say. Um, and it is its own collection, which I found really interesting when I read it the first time. Um, I know through the editing process, we we sort of went, moved away from that a bit, but I'm glad we we sorted that out. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'm really curious if you could just share sort of um, how the piece came about and and what drove you to wanting to to write collections. It 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 is it's structured to look like a collection. I had been doing a lot of this. I was like, there's something here, and walking away. Um, with a bunch of the different pieces that kind of came together in this piece, uh, interestingly. So the thread that brought it together was this trip I made um, that I that frames the whole piece, the trip to the Upper East Side and going to the museum. For me, oftentimes going to a museum for whatever reason, often brings me the thread. Never before has the mm. thread been going to the museum. 
(laughs) So the years, you know, I talk about a library ladder, which has its own long standalone piece that um, never really felt right on its own. And so I worked a little bit out of that piece, talking about the sort of smaller objects in my house comes from a not great, but really fun to write poem (laughs) that I had played with last summer. But I've always been really fascinated by the objects that people choose to keep, Mm -hmm. um, that they choose to share. Like, what what is that? What What are you trying to convey with the things you keep public and what are you trying to hold on to with the things you keep private I I like to go to antique stores and like pick things up and look at them and wonder what how they wound up here that's just I don't know it's always been it's objects have always objects that catch my attention have always been very inspiring for me I'm really glad you said that because uh an idea that I've been very interested in for quite some time is um the idea of objects and places having history that no one knows about but it's there in in like all the things of that place or or the etches on a certain object like it has this energy to it that you know we might not be able to ever articulate because we weren't the people who were there when the object was being created or the people were living in that house or whatever it might be but it's always interesting to think about sort of yeah what was um in the past when you when you wrote about your your grandmother, um, was that something that right away came? Um, was that like at the beginning of the piece, or was that something that came? That came. That came as I worked. As I worked, yeah. you know, I I knew she was in there, but then when I was like, oh, this is about my grandma. Like I didn't expect that. I didn't realize how big uh, that was. It was like a tribute to my my grandmother. Yeah. Um. When I until after <clears throat> I had, and not even after I had written it. It wasn't until it was reflected back to me, um, I sent it off to someone as an early reader. And uh, she was like, I love this tribute to your grandmother. And I was like, oh, I said, get this, that is that, isn't wow. it? Yeah, so yeah. I, I, it took me to not only, and it took me to step back and then have it reflected to me for me to really see that that's what it was about. Wow. She, you know, she passed away it's been a long time now. It left a big hole in the sort of fabric of our family. This piece helped me make peace with a lot of it. That's great. Um, yeah. that, that Sometimes that's the best thing writing can do. So I'm glad that was oh, the yeah. case. Um, and, and I think the, the relationship that you describe with your grandmother and sort of how she's always there um, in all the things that you see and interact with, um, I think it's such a beautiful sentiment. And it gives the piece so much heart uh, and I think a lot of people can can really relate to that so so thank you for sharing that it's fantastic yeah. moving on from the piece a bit I'm, I'm curious to know what you're currently working on before I wrote the lifting heavy things the book I had been working with this idea not acknowledging that I would have to then share my work with people um, <laughs> about actually doing some similar writing uh, about family and nostalgia and memory really framed through food. Um, And in the intervening years, since I've sort of picked that up and put it down a couple times, I have really examined my own relationship with food and family. Um, And I think I have this very new lens with which to approach it again. So I actually took very firm steps to getting that started not too long ago you know I got the post-it notes going and uh, some deadlines going and starting to actually talk to people about the piece you know the the various but it would be a collection of essays and starting to talk to people about what those would look like and kind of making them real but I do think it's going to be a very different pro the different process from the last big project because I I have a lot to process. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And in order to write well about emotionally charged stuff, you really need to work through it. I am actually taking, just to give myself some structure right now, um, a a essay class through uh, creative nonfiction journal. Just to 
give some shape to my practice and maybe help me think about uh, different forms to play with because that yeah. can be really inspiring. <clears throat> I like what you said about um, needing to process things, especially when they're personal and sort of very emotional and you haven't worked through them. Uh, and, you know, writing can sometimes be that catharsis and that way of working through it. So you write, it's very emotional, sentimental. You might be angry or upset or sad about something. Um, and, you know, that's the first draft and then the next draft, you can sort of look at it a bit more logically and, and take out the stuff that, that works and the stuff that might be a bit too sobby. <laughs> I'm impressed that you can do that in the second draft. That take, I'm like, that's like draft seven. <laughs> Somebody no. asked me just yet today, like, oh, what have you been up to the past couple of days? And I was like, I've been writing a lot in the epistolary <laughs> form, which is really a fancy way of me saying I've been writing lots of long emotional emails <laughs> that I'm not sending to anyone. <laughs> no, that's so true. I said the second draft, but I meant like the eighth. <laughs> so the, the collection of essays that you're talking about, is it going to be centered around food and family and relationships or? I think it's, it is going to definitely be... Um, food and relationships and I think family and family will definitely be a big part if you want to spend time and process all the heavy stuff you need to be able to laugh lovingly at yourself and your loved ones absolutely <laughs> so. and it helps us you know remember that life isn't that serious at the end of the day which is important so I, I want to ask you a very big question which I've been asking everyone that I've chatted with okay. uh, and usually I send the questions in advance so I'm sorry that I'm definitely putting you on the spot um, but what would you say is the purpose of art and this can definitely be your personal opinion I know it's a very big question you know well, the first word that popped to me so we'll go with that is um, connection especially with something like well really any form of storytelling is I am sharing a piece of me with whoever is consuming it, looking at it, engaging with it. A lot of what I'm drawn to write about are actually things where maybe I feel shame or I feel weird, but there's another part of me that's like, yeah, probably most people feel this way. So yeah. like, go ahead, like blow the door open on it and see what happens. And maybe that's why going to a museum also tends to help me with my writing because it's a different, I'm getting the opportunity to feel like I'm connecting to somebody else's story feeling experience and maybe being able to reflect how that shows up for me but you know we've been making music and dancing since very early man and there is something about um, fostering community through art that just seems to be in our dna it feels like a fundamental right and it can't be stopped it's just part of being human amen I love that. Thank you. Because you're a writer, uh, we always love to understand how writers work. And I'm curious to know if you have any advice uh, that you'd give a writer if they were, if they were wondering, you know, how do I write a good personal essay or, or what are some tips that you think would be good for just a general writer who's trying to, to get their work published or even finishing their work? I love this compliment. Uh, and I'm happy to brag about it that my voice really comes through that I have a very strong voice and it comes through in all of my writing and people like it which is nice <laughs> I think for me it was actually from some advice I got actually after writing the fan letter um okay <laughs> the response was one of the things was try to be as honest as possible mm. and not only do I try to be as honest as possible and so sometimes I write things that are not going to make it for public consumption, right? You know, they, but I do write it. Um, and in being as honest, part of being honest is also really saying it the way you would say it. Um, and so I think the reason that I have a strong voice is simply because I am using my voice and not someone else's. That's awesome. And it, it sounds so simple, but I think that's a terrifying it's sentiment. oh yeah it's really scary and it yeah. takes i told you i started writing by trying to write in these other people's voices yeah right and that's how many of us make it in you know we get inspired and we want to emulate and that's a little safer right because if that voice gets rejected well it wasn't really you mm, yeah but yeah it's it's unnerving to put yourself out there and then be like oh i mean now it really feels like when i because i write personal 
and I write in my voice. So I'm like, oh, are they gonna like me? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, we loved you. Ah, yay! <laughs> the essay was great. So uh, th- that's your affirmation for the day. <laughs> Thank you. They loved me. I'm gonna write it on my mirror. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate it. It was awesome chatting with you today. It was really great chatting with you.